the bulletin thingy there. Um, I, I teach this fairly regularly um, over at Calvary and in retreats and different aspects of it, but we're really been breaking it down in here, pulling it apart, uh, trying to get it to go from head to heart, simmer in it, jacuzzi in it, let it soak in like an essential oil, uh, put a few drops under the tongue. Uh, I don't know. I just, I feel weird today. <laughs> I'm happy today. Um, not that I'm not happy all the time, but. You ain't that man. Huh? <laughs> yeah? Uh, my hecklers are here today. All right. Um, so, uh, so we're going to move now into this next, next aspect of 2 Peter chapter 1, which I like to look at as a process of alchemy. Uh, anybody ever read The Alchemist? Highly recommend it if you haven't read it. It's, uh, I don't read much fiction, um, but, um, but The Alchemist is a really, really great book about a journey of transformation and looking and hunting for something. And The Alchemist is turning uh, lower metals into higher metals, tin to gold. It's that process. So um, that mysterious, mystical process of, of, of transformation from lower to higher. So if we looked in terms of our transformation in our life, going from human to godly, it would be like alchemy. It would be as impossible as alchemy. Um, but that's what the transformative life is about. And that's why it says I can't do it. I'm incapable of doing it, but what I can't do, God can't do through me. That's the miracle of the recognition at the beginning of this journey of being able to say I can't. And the first thing I let go of is the expectation that I thought I was supposed to be able to. And, and that's, that's the relief. So we're in the middle of this, this transformation of looking at our step of faith, action taken in the face of great fear and doubt. Not a lack of fear, not a lack of doubt. It's movement in the middle of my fear and in my doubt. It's the most fragile, venture of our life because it's one in which we've never been there before and we're practically incapable because we've already admitted that we don't have what it takes. What a relief to realize that I can let go of the expectations that I thought I was supposed to know and be able to. And then we took a step in the right direction and we moved from faith to goodness. Goodness is not good behavior or righteousness or perfection, it means I'm facing the right direction. It means I'm heading down the right direction, a new direction, an adventure. We're letting go of, of righteousness. We're letting go of the hope that I could somehow make myself perfect. We're now instead going from our identification or our definition of perfect from the um, idea that I am becoming something that I'm not to I am increasing in what I already was. I'm increasing what I didn't know I was within myself. I'm not becoming something new. I'm unfolding the me that I never knew in the first place. That had gotten covered up with what I invented, what I created, what I auditioned for, what I applied to get uh, the name tag I put on my shirt. If you notice, we haven't done name tags here. We've been going for now see two seasons and 80 plus episodes. And I fought off the name tags and maybe it's a good idea, but the beginning simply because we don't know each other by naming each other. We know each other by engaging each other. And if you forget people's names, then welcome to my crowd. <laughs> I'm really good with faces. And pretty much every face that I know, pretty much, except for my children, and sometimes that's sketchy, is hay. There's a lot of hay. I know all kinds of hays. And every one of them looks different. Hey! I like you. And I don't know your name, but God, I like you. Anybody feel that way? Well, if it's everyone, why do we feel so guilty for it? Yeah. 
right? Because we're saying it to somebody else that does that. We're in, <coughs> engaging each other in the practice. Pete Rollins has a great series with Rob Bell on his Robcast on love. If you if you if you want to really delve into something that will totally take you out of your familiar area, what you're used to, uh, check this guy out, Pete Rollins, and he has a three-part series with Rob Bell on on his Robcast. He's, he's so about him, and. Um, not that I'm not, but you know, um, but but his in that discussion, you'll hear some amazing things about this journey into what love is, and it'll just you're just like you'll stop it and just kind of think about it for a while, and um, and and that aspect of love where he says that love is actually what brings things to life. Love brings things to life, and. And I think that that is where we're, we're afraid to be awkward with each other. But when we are awkward with each other and acknowledge each other, we're bringing them to life. We're saying, I, I see you. I acknowledge you. We're bringing it to life, even in our awkwardness. And so that aspect of, of loving that brings to life is where we're heading in this series of the final stage of this is love, the alchemy, the transformation when I can feel free to experience and, and be loved. Um, and you would think it would be easy, but we, we really don't know what love is very well. It's, it's intangible in nature. It's not an object. We can't control it. We can't make me, we can't make someone love me like that old song, you know, I'll, you made me love you. I didn't want to do it. Well, it's actually more accurate than I'm going to make you love me. Uh, that's the other song. Uh, but it comes on us. We, we fall into it. Uh, P. Rollins says that dating services miss one thing that's very important about love. It's the fear of falling. See, dating services says... I'm going to match this thing up as well as I can so that I don't go through the painful experience of falling, of, of uh, conflict, of that um, conflict of we don't have this in common, can I accept you the way you are? Um, love is a phenomenon that way. And so is God a phenomenon that way. We can't objectify it. You know what? What is going on all over the country in, in women coming out of, of their secrecy and saying they've been objectified? It's a huge thing. It's a huge thing from a, it's an uncomfortable thing, but it actually is part of the transformational aspect of saying, I am no longer wanting to be seen as an object. There's nothing wrong with that. But we also have to stop seeing others as an object. See, when we don't understand love, we, we do things like you know, we question ourselves and then we look to something else to help us heal what it is that, that we need healing in. Okay? So in other words, well, let me put it this way. My spiritual director asked me one time when I was having such a difficult time letting go of a relationship. I know nobody else in here has, that, has had that difficulty. <laughs> letting go. What was she giving you that you weren't giving yourself. It has taken me years to figure that out. It's a deep question. What is that giving me that I'm not giving myself? What is that relationship? What is that? Even a, even a good healthy one, you have to ask yourself that question. What is that drug giving me that I'm not giving myself? What is that drink? What is that job? What is, what is it that it is giving me that I'm not giving myself? Okay, for example, say um, that person makes me feel like I'm attractive because I didn't think I was attractive. Well, now when I'm not with them, I must not be attractive anymore. See, that self, that self consciousness, that insecurity. So I have to have them with me. So the addiction is starting to uh, solidify. I feel attracted because I think they're attractive. So they're being attracted to me 
makes me feel attractive, but when they are upset with me or they disappear or they break up, I must no longer be attractive. Do you see how that works? So when we do that with God in nature of our sense of belonging, I feel guilty and shame, so I must not be belong. I must not belong. So God has to stay separate from me until I earn it back. And we get that we get that kind of dysfunctional aspect of it. Okay. So um, so before we go into um, okay, let's let's begin with a little bit of uh, silence and no, because I'll probably get to say things, um, but it will be solitude anyway. And just put ourselves in a position of, of rest and peace and listening and awareness. Let's be present together. Include all things rather than fighting all things. We include every child's noise, every air conditioning sound, any door opening rather than violently trying to remove it, we include it. Let the sounds be a part of our awareness. on the floor. The weight of our body on the chair. Rest into it. Become aware of our breathing. reminds us that we all have the breath of God. I inhale the voice of God that says, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. And I exhale your desires for me. God, bring into our lives peace in the midst of chaos. Light in the midst of confusion. Joy in the middle of sorrow. What do you have for us today, Paul? What do you have for us today, Father? We will be still and know that you are God. <laughs> Don't you just become aware of children, voices, and it's like pleasurable. It's so nice. All right, so we are moving into this next thing. So we talked about faith. Faith, action, taking the face of great fear and doubt, adding to your faith, goodness. We're going the right direction. It's not about good behavior, stumbling awkwardly. We're going the right direction. It's unfamiliar. It's a route we've never gone before. It's unfamiliar. We add to our goodness <coughs> knowledge. 
Because along the way, what happens when we're heading the right direction? We learn because we fail. Because the baby learning how to walk hits his head on the coffee table. And it's like, okay, try it in open fields. Along the way, we fail because God is stripping away the inessentials. And I move from knowledge into the 70s punk band. Not self-control and not willpower, but soul control. Leaning into the soul. We lean, we lean into the spirit that will lead the soul and the body will follow. Spirit. Anybody remember what the spirit has in it? Exactly. I gave you that one. Wisdom. Intimacy. And the souls, every part of our personality, our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings. Okay, you coming here this morning, even if your soul was like, nah, not so sure, wanna, I don't know, right, you know, there was something in your spirit that's like, soul come with me. Because my emotions, my feelings, my thoughts might be in opposition to what my spirit is saying. The deepest desire of my, my heart, what you're doing is you are following the relentless and furious love of your intimacy with the big ass spirit. Going into the mystery of I have no idea what I'm gonna encounter, what I'm gonna experience, I don't know. But I, I'm, I'm gonna go anyway. And my soul isn't satisfied until afterwards. Okay, does that make sense? The soul, when it has its way, it's satisfied now. The soul is always satisfied later <coughs> as a result. Because the, the soul, the emotions, thoughts, and feelings respond to things. The spirit acts on things. The soul, the personality, uh, responds and creates. And uh, it, 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 everything it seems to be a reaction. I, I, I'm much better off when I'm inspired. I do well when I'm inspired. When I am uninspired, I don't do as well. So the spirit moves and does what it does without inspiration. It's because it's operating in truth. I am worthy because God has declared me worthy, not because I feel worthy. I am worthy. That's the truth of it. So I am not... My, then my soul, after I act in my identity of worthiness, my soul becomes satisfied. That's what I thought. Okay? So to the young girl that I was working with over at Ramuda, who had spent a life up to 18 years, uh, 18 years old um, trying to find uh, security in the form of affection and guise, the deepest part of her said responded this way when I said, look, 10 years from now, if you're in a relationship with someone that you have mutual admiration and great respect and you know that he loves you and you love him and you honor them, you just look up to them and they look up to you and you have this shared relationship of mutual respect and admiration and they honor you and you honor them and it's actually fun in every way, both spiritual, soulful, physical, everything. Would that be worth waiting for? And she goes, oh yeah. And that was at 18. It would be worth waiting till she was 28 to have that type. But her soul says, what makes you think that you can have that? What makes you think that you're worthy enough to be in a relationship where there is mutual respect? Don't you remember what you did? Don't you remember? What makes you think? You already blew plan A. I know, it's, it, it, you'll scream. You realize you blew plan A. Um, see, the, re the religious experience... <laughs> Love you. Um, the, the 
the spiritual experience, we're going to include it. <laughs> the spiritual experience says that from the fundamentalist, either or, black and white, is that God has a wonderful plan for your life. When we hear that, it sounds good and exciting at the time. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Cool. I wonder what it is. Now I have paranoia that what I do is not going to bring about God's plan for my life. The right relationship, the right thing, the right job. Where do I go? Where do I live? Who do I love? Uh, I'm watching myself live. That's when the teachings of that kind of theology become insidious. That God has a plan, wonderful plan for your life. God has a wonderful plan for his life. And he's inviting me to come into it. What happens in this world, I have no idea what's going to happen and what's going to go on. I, I can plan all I want, but for some reason, I keep screwing it up and going to plan B. And then plan C. I'm on plan Z. The miracle of God's work through the Spirit is that He will make your plan Z His plan A when I give it all up. When I give up the need to be perfect, when I give up the need to have it all together, when I give up the, the, the feeling like I didn't know enough. That is, that is the good news of the Gospel that those who proclaim the good news is about getting it right. It, it, it just messes their whole message up. And, and that's, you know, remember, remember that old cartoon, some of you old guys with me, uh, Fractured Fairy Tales? That was a great, the guy was, remember the Fractured Fairy That was so good. They retold the stories, you know, of Rapunzel and that kind of thing, and it's like, fractured. Um, that's what ours is. We had a fairy tale, we're living a fractured fairy tale. But it, it, it unfolds as it goes, and we go into it through that faith, goodness, knowledge. I'm entering into this. I'm getting on that raft, and I don't know where the rapid is or what that is, but I'll tell you what, the conflict that happens on the rapid when I thought I was going to die causes me to become intimate with everybody who's on the raft with me once we get through it. The conflict in my life and the difficulty in my soul when I allow God to participate with me and I with Him, I become intimate with that God in the process of that, where before I was trying to avoid any mistakes or any problems or any sin or anything, now I realize that's going to be part of the journey. But I can't, I don't have to anymore feel like I need to create destruction in order to end it all. That I can actually go through the difficulties and sufferings of this life and it will cause intimacy with God because He is in it with me all the time, at all times. And that's what I'm trying to teach my soul to pay attention to, that it is God with me even on my worst day. That He cannot depart from me because He promised I will never leave you or forsake you. That even on my worst day when I don't feel it soulfully, that God is deep within me and I am humbled by it. I was shamed by it. Now I'm humbled. Because I realize that that is what grace is. That if this, all these ideas and things that I write up here, and all of our events in our life are all in here, grace is the frame. And no matter what I do, it expands. That's a stunner. Because I thought grace was over here. Like pity. God's pity. Feeling sorry for me. He loves me, but he's tolerating me waiting for me to get it together until I understand that the grace surrounds me and it expands. It's almost like being the favorite child and feeling like I'm getting away with more than everyone else. And you know what? You probably are. Because of God's grace. Not because He's telling you you can do whatever you want, but because you are learning that when you do whatever you want, you're not experiencing everything that God has. Heaven on earth. It's living that from the inside out. So you can't help but have this part of you in here begin to expand 
into the soul and the emotions. So now you can experience the romance with God as a reaction because the soul reacts. That's worship. I don't worship in order to clean the slate or get God to like me because I went to church or mass or whatever. I worship because He is already with me before I even started. And I'm stunned by it. I am now living the life from inside out and it's beginning to expand into my life and my soul. And then it's almost as if I am reflecting love. The love that was given me, it's beginning to reflect the love that I'm experiencing. And that's the next place on here, which is godliness. Okay. Godliness. What is godliness? Godliness is not good behavior. Godliness is a little bit different. St. John and I, he's a neighbor of mine and, and, and we are hanging out all the time. Okay? John and I are hanging out all the time and, and I, I, I don't wear glasses but I start wearing glasses. I get the same one. Where'd you get those glasses? And I go and I get some similar ones and then pop the lenses out and so, you know. <laughs> and I, I start to go some of the places that John goes to and then I go home one day and my kids are like, Dad, where'd you get that laugh? What the heck? You don't laugh like you're laughing just like John. You've been hanging out so much with John. You know people who have done that, right? Then all of a sudden they start almost behaving like that person they're with. They're like, wait a minute, you never do that, whatever. I've developed a Johnliness. <laughs> Because of who I'm hanging out with, I've developed a Johnliness. It wasn't that I intended to be like John. It's that I was hanging out with him so much that I couldn't help but almost reflect who I've been hanging out with lately. You guys, you see that in the spiritual life? When you hang out with God, you can't help but have it rub off on you. If you're trying to get to God by changing yourself to be more godly, you're going to be disappointed because all you can see is more hellishness, more difficulty, more, more evil, more soulful nature. But when in my present state I hang out with God with intention and I just bask in the beauty of His love and I'm baffled by why He would love me at all, when I realized that He was with me through all of my adventures of this life and He never was aside from me, I am humbled by that and my soul says it's good. And He is unashamed. Every time He saw somebody in the Bible, He didn't walk up, Jesus didn't walk up to some... some he didn't walk... She didn't, Jesus didn't walk up to the, to the adulterous woman in the middle of all those men that were getting ready to stone her and said, have you heard of the four spiritual laws? Have you read the book of the laws of attraction? Have you read the secret? He said, where are your accusers? Because he knew that the lies that she was telling herself were what were keeping her in a self-consciousness of shame. Here. It wasn't anything else around her. It wasn't even those guys that had the stones. It was her belief about herself. And he sent the accusers away first. Then he says, where are your accusers? And she's standing face to face with Jesus the rabbi and says, where are your accusers? And she's like, I have none? And he's like, that's right, and neither do I accuse you. And that came long before he said, behave. Another instance in where he said, you belong. You belong. And he wanted her to know that's the truth in the spirit. Now he wanted to hear the voice of her soul say, it is true and I believe it, though I don't feel it. Though I don't feel it, I will accept that as truth and I will repeat it over and over again. I'll write it on my mirror with lipstick and, until I until I'll see it every morning that I am the Beloved's and His desire is for me and I will never forget the sound of the thud of the rocks that were going to kill me as they hit the ground <coughs> as those religious people walked away in their shame because it's not about what you do, it's about who you know. Do we know that about our jobs, don't we? It's more valuable on who you know than what you do. Why do we change that with religion? It's about who you know, not what you do. 
You know somebody, you can get to the front. You pay top price, you sit behind the comped ones. It's about who you know. That ought to be the stunning revelation that before you ever walk out of this room, if you had a list of things you felt guilty for and a list of things you felt shame for, that God takes a look at that less list as you go to the confession booth of your heart and he looks at it and goes, hmm, guess what? I already knew it. I already knew it. Hang out with me. Hang out with me. Stop trying to do my work your way. Instead, hang out with me. Jesus said, follow me 17 times. He said, worship me zero. That's a stunning revelation. What do you think he wants us to do? Hang out with him. Hang out with him. And he said, drop everything you're doing because you keep holding on to stuff. You know, your, your, your fishing net might be the net you've been using to get approval from someone or something or high standing or money or accolades or affection or attention or safety. That have been the net that you were holding that Jesus said, drop it and come follow me. You're like, yeah, but the payoff's not going to be there. I'm not going to get what I wanted out if I drop the net. He said, like, drop the net, go empty hand and come follow me. And in the midst of your woundedness and your pain and your insecurity and you're not having it all together yet, he teaches you how to heal the blind and how to soothe the wounded and to raise the dead even in your state as you are because you don't have to wait anymore because it's about who you know, not what you do. If that isn't a, 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 a shocker to our theology of the past, I don't know what is. Christ in me even on my worst day. If you thought you were going to come in here and clean the slate, start all over again, dust yourself off, pull yourself up from your bootstraps, please God and feel better once you leave, you're wrong. Because there isn't anything that can clean our slate, fix what we've done, change the events, but what we're letting go of is the expectation that we had to do that. That God is saying, bring me, like the fortune cookie I opened a few weeks ago, God heals the brokenhearted, we just have to bring him all the pieces. That he will use every one of those things in our life to transform and to build our story. That's why I put this song lyric in here. I love this. In the song, Art and Me. And in your picture book, I'm trying hard to see, turning endless pages of this tragedy. Yet you're sculpting every move. And in it, you compose a symphony. How awesome is that? Okay, so now I'm going to take a minute to reflect on the last four weeks, five weeks on this stuff and things maybe I've even said today. And if you want me to speak on some things or clarify some things, because I've had some individual conversations with some of you about the practice of it and looking at these things or whatever, or if you have an epiphany about these things that you've been experiencing or what this is meaning to you or even today, let's have a conversation about that. Is there anything that I can clarify on these aspects of faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, uh, willpower? That's the loop we get caught in in going back to the very beginning instead of pushing towards perseverance and godliness. Okay. Any, any conversation? Any thoughts? Heather? I mean, God, I think. Natasha. Yeah. Natasha. See what happens when you miss life. I, oh, okay. okay. I thought I got over it. I thought I got over it. Oh, okay. Well, no, I just wanted to thank you because I haven't been coming around, but uh, I haven't seen this very cold body in, in a while. And uh, it just reminded me when I was in Calgary. And uh, it just took me back and, like, now I remember how it was in the beginning and just to remember the truth and the feeling and the body and I just appreciate that and yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, I appreciate you. So that's it. Anybody else? We have to be reminded of these things. 
They have to go deep in the heart. Meditate on them. Think on them. Fill your emotional jacuzzi with all those truths and sit in it. I just got some really bad images in there that I don't want to remember. <laughs> Any, any other, any questions, any clarification? Yes. Could you just talk a little bit more about the window and how that window actually works? Because I think I, I get lost okay. in that piece of it. So, So we're listening to the counterintuitive things of this of the spirit. So remember, these are emotions, feelings, the will of the self. So when I'm living the spiritual life, there's opportunities that I have. Uh, Jesus described it as um, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. What he's really talking about is this movement of, uh, window of sorts, or as um, Megan called it, because I put it in the wrong butter. place, a stick of butter. Okay. <laughs> so I travel through this little opportunity, this small opportunity, to follow the whisper of the spirit of truth that says, what my soul is yelling opposite about. So I'm listening and I'm nurturing to that moment. Don't go there. So as we move from um, where we're going into the soul control, so I am now being led by the spirit of truth. So any lies, anything that is counter to what my spirit is wanting, I have to take an action in the face of great fear and doubt. That's when I'm stepping, leading by the spirit. In that moment, in that moment, we all have an option in that moment. And there's a part in our brain, uh, I can't remember the uh, dude's name that, I, that talks about this from the brain called the reticular activating device. And in that moment, we have a fraction of a second on how we are going to make a different move. And so the loud voice of our typical nature and thinking is what we believed about ourselves growing up. Okay? So he describes it as like when you're young and uh, you're in school and everyone's singing uh, in, in music class and you start to sing and somebody says, you can't sing. You're a lousy singer or something like that. You hear it one time and then all of a sudden you believe that and then everything confirms it in different ways and you believe that, it's lodged in there. Okay? So then when the teacher says, hey, you know, we're going to do our Christmas pageant and we need some people to sing solos, you're the first one to not want to do that. You're like, I, don't, I can't sing. See, I, I, now I've become that. I can't sing. But the minute I'm going to be free and decide I'm going to do that, I have to make a decision in that moment. Say, somebody later on in life, you're an adult and you really love singing, and they say, hey, would you sing a solo? In that instant, you have a decision on whether you're going to say yes to your new thought or no, believing the lie of your past. Okay? That goes even in the dark night in your soul. When you're, in, you're alone and you're like, loneliness sucks. I'm going to use, I'm going to drink, I'm going to go a different direction. Uh, that aspect of it, there is that fraction of a moment that I use and access my resources to do what is better for me in the spirit that my soul will be glad in the long run. Right? Going back to what I had said before, the soul acts now, the spirit later, the soul, we want the soul to become a responder to what I acted on in that moment and be satisfied. So it's in that moment that I make that split, deck, split second decision to listen to the truth of my spirit. Because we instinctively react, okay? And then have to apologize. Isn't that true? I mean, that's normal human behavior. We are turning uh, this inside out to where we catch ourselves. You know, yesterday I had a, 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 an anxious, a, a little 
territorial anxiety. And my nephew had rearranged some furniture so that he could eat and watch his show and my chair was moved and I was like Sheldon on Big Bang Theory. And so I very calmly and compassionately and lovingly said, hey, you know what? Uh, don't move. Uh, and I said what I said and then later I realized it really wasn't a big deal. It was because I was I was uneasy about other things that were going on in my life. That I was feeling anxiety. And I had to call him and tell, you guys know Elliot, right? And, and, um, and I told Elliot, I said, hey, I'm really sorry. I said, it really isn't a big deal and you did nothing wrong. I was feeling uh, uncomfortable inside of me and things were out of my, my familiar order and whatever. <laughs> and he texted me back and he said, he says, I get it, I understand it, I'm just glad you owned up to it. <laughs> and I was like, my soul says, no, you don't get it. I wasn't as wrong as I said I was wrong. <laughs> no, we get into that, right? But going through that little window of opportunity would have been for me to stop and not say anything yet. And to ask myself what I'm feeling right now. And what are the lies I've been, I'm telling? Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, this kind of affirms what I've felt my entire adult life is that when I look in the mirror, the image I see is not really who I am. You know, because I blur it. And all I see is the outside. I don't see the inside. And this for me is seeing on the inside, looking at that same image of me but it's not who I am you know it's not my heart or my soul or my well it is my spirit um and that's a wonderful thing that kind of takes you off the hook yeah you know that what you see is not really what it is and 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 to be able to know that we don't need to achieve or conquer or break come to something what I was talking about before about love uh becoming sublime that idea that sublime Sublime means that not that you are the best person in the world or you're the most beautiful child in the world. This is another Peter Rollins thing. Uh, but that you, God saying, you are the most beautiful person in the world in your imperfection. I perfectly love you in your imperfection. That's sublime. With all that you have. And we're learning to do that with each other. You know, instead of trying to change each other. Um, and, and so that, that transformative aspect of it means that I'm healing my distorted images, not only of myself, but the way I heal my distorted images of how I see myself is to heal my distorted images of God. If I see him as judging, condemning, waiting for me, tolerating, I'm not really seeing the beauty of God. I'm seeing the image that got created in my head. So I can't see myself accurately if I don't see God more accurately. I just think he's really irresponsible for loving me. <laughs> and, and it's nice to know that I don't have to chase him anymore and look for him anymore. He's already in my place. That's right. That's right. You know? That's and so, so having to change the feeling about how you feel about yourself is, is actually a misguided adventure. Okay? You can believe something about yourself even though you don't feel it. Believe and then behave. Belong, believe, behave. So I'm transforming how I feel. If you think you have to feel differently before you go on this journey, you'll never go. So it's like, God, I don't, I don't necessarily know your judgment or like your judgment. I'm not really sure where I'm headed. I don't like, nevertheless, I will follow you. Okay, I, I, will, allow, I will allow you to love me on, on your terms instead of my terms. Because if it's on my terms, I'm gonna tell you, how, how you what you need to ignore. <laughs> what you need to tolerate, and how you need to punish me. But perfect love casts out all fear. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is fear. Okay, just read the paper. <coughs> Watch the news. If love is the default, we're being driven in a culture of fear. Hate is produced out of fear. The opposite of love is fear. You're different than me, I'm uncomfortable with it, and I'm afraid of you, so I'm gonna to have to hate you. The opposite of love is fear. 
I'm afraid that once I get where I want to go, that I'm not going to be able to follow through with what I said I would do. It's fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. I'm not sure I can <clears throat> say what I really feel or what I'm confused about. Uh, it's personal. It's my thing of uh, that I struggle with because I feel like professionally I'm one person and I can behave in a manner that is healthy for me as well as for others. But when I get into, and I appreciate it, you made a few comments about marriages and that, you know, last week and this week and maybe other times, but when I get into those kind of relationships, close interpersonal relationships like that, and I know where it comes from, I just have difficulty with changing, or maybe I quit <coughs> trying to change, but everything I feel, you know, I start feeling good, I feel good about coming here, I appreciate what you say, I feel closer to God. Um, but then, all of a sudden, this bulb goes off in my head and it says, oh, okay, well, if you're so tight with God and you're accepting and you're all these things, then why are you getting out of this relationship? Because my history is, it's about you. You can always change it. Somehow, I'm the one that always needs to make a change, a difference in me, I need to accept, I need to do all these other things, but then in the meantime, I'm not really getting my needs met, but then I'm saying, well, you know, how important is that? Uh, because I have God. Why is it so important to get my needs met? I, do you understand? I mean, it's, I could go on and on about it, but I don't really know how to take up the time. Well, a lot of what you said is happening here, okay. right? Right. That's where the over-analysis comes in. So, so, so it's, it, it, needs, it needs to all go away when you spend time with God. That He's not seeing you through what you're seeing yourself through. Okay. He's seeing you as you are and as He sees you, and that will help you when you're processing that later. So the closer I am. Yeah. Re remove yourself from, from that for a while and just spend time with God. And that's why silence is valuable that's why that aspect of it and then when you have trouble with it in that moment you just become aware and curious as to why you're struggling with it what is that saying to me okay. see it so now the, the as you look at that you are entering into your true self okay so all that dialogue and over here um, is 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 over here I don't know what to write uh, it's all it's it's all over here and it's all I'm thinking that I'm my thoughts I'm thinking that my struggles and everything is here when I step away from it and and I see it separate from myself now it's me and God looking at what I was thinking about it's no longer identifying me I'm able to observe it so the minute you go into the observing self you go into your true self of being because this part of it in here isn't a thing. And, I, and I'm able to step aside with God and become an observer of it. If this were shame, when I'm close to it, I feel shame, I am shame, I'm shameful. People see me through my shame. And God sees me through my shame. If I recognize that shame is not a thing, it's a soulful reaction, then I can step away from it and look at it together, God and me looking at my shame. Does that make sense? So you become an observer of what it is that's going on instead of the participant in this thing. Yeah. What you said at the beginning of service like I can really relate to like when I'm motivated and inspired, I feel like, yay, go, you know, go God, like but I'm realizing that that's that's a motivation coming from my my soul versus enthusiasm and motivation coming from my spirit, the big S, for me, because the times when I need to have motivation coming from my big S spirit is like that window of opportunity, the stick of butter, like when I need to dig in and like be like, you know what, things aren't hunky-dory right now. Like, and this is just for me, like, I, so a woman like giving childbirth, like when she really has to dig in, like that's when I need to dig in and like, breathe and breathe with God and pray with God. Suffer. And yes, and yeah. because 
but that's a deeper enthusiasm for me. Like, I think it's an enthusiasm and a, because I know I can be motivated to like, yay, and I leave church here and I'm like, yay, let's do this day, let's, and I, that's a, but it's a surface level of um, motivation for me. Like, the motivation is a deeper, when things get hairy, like, that I can just dig in and, and be motivated to turn and face that window and take action and walk through it. Like, that's real. Thing. And that's the route that we've never gone before. It's conflict. It's conflict, and intimacy is at the other side of conflict, and if you're a conflict avoider, then you never experience deep intimacy. Because you pass through conflict, conflict within my swell, myself, it's unfamiliar, so I feel inner conflict, uh, conflict in, in life and in circumstances, and I choose to go through the middle of it, and I experience intimacy. If I avoid conflict, then I'm wanting everything to be harmonious and, and the same, and the same, you know? So, um, so yeah, so we're going the route, in going the route that we've never gone before, we're entering in through some of the conflict. Okay, I know we've gone a little, little over, so if you need to leave, you're welcome to do that, but I'd like to move into the communion part and just kind of like overlay some of the, the conversation we just had in this one aspect of it. What you were saying, Megan, of going through that difficult aspect of it, Peter, when Peter denied Jesus three times, can you imagine the shame that he felt? I mean, he was supposed to be the strong guy. He was supposed to be the one that had it, you know, was going to be the, everything was going to be built on him. Peter, you're the rock. Okay? You're Mr. Prudential. You're the man. He walked on water with Jesus. He did all these things. He sliced off the dude's ear. Um, you know, he battled with Jesus on all this stuff. He was the most committed and devoted, seemingly the strong one of the bunch. And he said, I will never deny you, Jesus. And Jesus said, you're going to do it three times, dude. Okay? That's accepting our humanity that he wasn't accepting at that moment. And then in Jesus' darkest moment, in his most difficult time, as he watched him whipped, he denied Jesus, saying that he knew him, that he was associating with him. <coughs> How painful that must have been for Peter. How painful that must have been for Peter. Stephen, struggling in that aspect of it. And you know what the scriptures say? Is that number one, when Jesus came out of the, when they, when they saw the tomb was empty and then they saw the man who they believed was the spirit of Jesus and they're standing there and he says, go tell everyone everything's cool. And by the way, make sure you tell Peter. What a tender moment. Make sure you tell Peter. He, he cares about our, our shame and our difficulties, not understanding that aspect of it. And then when Peter himself is being whipped and, and punished, in the middle of that, it says that he begins to praise God in the midst of his suffering. And you know what I think it was? He might have denied him the first time, but for the first time, he started to experience Christ sharing in his sufferings and him sharing in Christ's sufferings of watching him get whipped. And every time he took it, all he could think was, I'm a friend of Jesus. I'm a friend of Jesus. Because he says we don't have a high priest that doesn't sympathize with our difficulties and our pain. He says that he understands everything we've ever gone through because he went through it. And I think that Peter at that moment went beyond soulful feelings and experience and went into the spirit that there is something greater going on. And you can do whatever you want to this body, but you cannot touch the soul and the spirit. That I am defined by what God says about me. And that's what we do when we take the bread... And we recognize that the brokenness of Christ is saying, I want to share in your sufferings. I'm no longer, I'm not ashamed of what you struggle with. I want to be with you in this. And every time you have this meal sharing experience with others, you're reminding each other, it's Christ in me, even on my worst day. And Jesus said, every time you do this, remember that I gave it all, I put all in. And I'm not asking you to go all in in the same way that I went all in. I'm saying go all in with me being in you. You and me and I and you. 
and every time we take this bread, we are expressing in that soulful part of us, the Spirit is saying to our weary soul, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we confess that we don't know You completely. Nevertheless, reveal to us who You are as though for the very first time. God, we confess that the weariness and anxiousness of our soul has been running the show, trying to define ourselves. So we take this moment to allow the big S spirit to speak the truth about who we are. We thank you that you welcome us to this meal sharing, to this communion, to this intimacy with you. And may it give you and us a chuckle that we've tried so hard to do this on our own and thought we actually could. May it give us a sense of laughter, of joy, of realizing how hard we have worked to figure ourselves out when we will never be able to do that. We rest in the truth that you know us and we follow you. Amen. So feel free to come up and